Next up is Claire Sloggart. Claire works as a bioinformatician and research fellow at the Victorian Life Sciences Computing Initiative at Melbourne University. And uh, her research interests include next generation sequence analysis, cancer genetics, and statistical methods. So Claire um, has a, a bachelor, bachelor's in science with honors and a PhD from the University of New South Wales. And she's part of the Nectar funded genomics virtual lab project. I will probably try to mirror. <laughs> Some. Yeah. I don't know why it doesn't um, auto detect. Once upon a time, it used to. Yeah. If you've arrived recently, uh, ah, the, there's a Wi Fi password on this uh, whiteboard here, and we'll Resolution be having um, catered morning tea <laughs> after this talk. Okay, cool. please give a warm welcome to Claire. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm honored to be speaking. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about Python for bioinformatics. I don't know how many people in the room are life sciences. Okay, a handful, but not a huge number. It's probably good that it's not a huge number because I'm going to, because um, since I've got a reasonably long Slot. I've got like 40 minutes. Is it working? Um, yep. We're just having some uh, issues with the display. <sighs> My slides have been taken away. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think I've got enough time to try to give you a bit of an introduction to genomics itself, which is a little bit off topic for the Python stuff, but it's very interesting and it means that you um, have some idea uh, what the genomic data looks like and what it means, which I think is, is important for talking about the code. Um, and I'm going to try to not spend too long talking because I want to do a little bit of a demo at the end. So at the end I will get to uh, just a fairly arbitrarily chosen example of how using IPython Notebook has changed the way I work uh, and a real analysis that I've, I've done with it and just show a small project I've been working on as well. So, how life works. So this may sound ambitious. Um, I'm gonna not assume too much knowledge. <laughs> I assume that kind of everyone in this day and age tends to have at least seen a picture of the spiral molecule. Like you have some vague idea that DNA is this spiral molecule and that it stores information maybe. Um, so I'm gonna start with this, this really basic stuff. It is a spiral molecule. Um, it stores your genetic information. There's a a copy of your DNA in every cell in your body and it's the same information stored in every cell. And it stores it as a four letter code. So you've probably seen that four letter code written. I mean, if you've seen this movie, then the name Gattaca is a kind of pun on this code because the four letters we use, the four letters DNA uses are A, G, C and T. So it's built out of four uh, nearly identical building blocks, four building blocks which we abbreviate as A, G, CGT, and when we write out data that we read from the genetic code, that's how we write it. Um, it's double-stranded because, firstly, that's uh, kind of stable, protects the information, it's hard to mutate it, uh, and secondly, it makes it easy to copy. So these bases are complementary. A only binds, roughly. A only binds to T, G only binds to C. So on each strand, you've got what we call the complement of the information on the other strand, which means if you want to make a copy, all you have to do is unzip the DNA and stick on the complementary bases, and now you've got two copies of your original DNA. And this is what cells actually do when they divide, when they replicate and make new cells in order to copy the information. So this is what the information looks like. Uh, this is point 
0.00003% of the human genome. It's actually the human genome. I took the giant text file, which is what we use to represent the human genome, and I cut and pasted a bit out of it. So if I showed you three million slides like this, I'd have described a person. Um, <laughs> so if I've got lots of time left over at the end. Um, so there's probably about a thousand bases on there. Uh, sorry, if I say bases, I mean letters. We call the nucleotides DNA is made up of bases. Um, and there's about three billion in the human genome. Um, so if I showed you three million slides like this, I would have described a person, but it wouldn't be very informative because it just says, you know, C-A-G-A-C-T-G-G-T-A, and what does that mean? So when we talk about the human genome, we do mean a giant set of sequences like this, but we also mean uh, a database of the variations, the common variations between individuals, because I say this is the human genome. Obviously, we're not all identical, so whose genome is this? Yeah, it's probably mostly a rich white man's genome. But <laughs> so we store this, and we also store a database of common differences between people, and we also store a set of what we call annotations. So for instance, which bits of this sequence describe a gene, right? And what is that gene? So there'll be some portion of this sequence which is the gene for insulin, for instance. Um, so the other thing I'm gonna talk about in this uh, quick little introduction is proteins. And the reason I'm talking about proteins is that they are kind of uh, probably the most important organic molecule. They, they form little molecular machines and um, catalysts, and they do most of the interesting and complex work in your body. So they're, they're building blocks, like muscle fibers, for instance, are proteins. Um, iron pumps that embed themselves in the walls of cells and pump ions in and out. Uh, enzymes, which are machinery, are the machinery that actually does the copying of DNA, for instance, is made of proteins. So if you know how to build proteins given some DNA, you know a fairly important chunk of how life works. So that's the chunk of stuff I'm trying to tell you about here. Um, so this is an overview of that process. And I won't have time to go into it in as much detail as I'd like, but very roughly that process is you have DNA and some portion of that DNA encodes a gene. Um, that portion of DNA is what we call transcribed, copied into RNA, which is a single-stranded molecule that contains exactly the same information but it's more accessible. And then that code is used to build a protein. I'm not gonna play this video because I don't think I have time, but if you get the slides and you want to, it's a little uh, molecular dynamics simulation of these processes in action, and it's really cool. So what do I mean by the genetic code? It's, well, the, the core thing that we mean, there's arguably a lot more to it now, but a really important aspect of it is this process of describing how you make a protein. So a protein is actually a chain of amino acids. So where DNA is made of four different types of building blocks, proteins made of 20 different building blocks, and they form a chain. And that chain folds into shape. So when you see this thing, this is actually one long chain just folded up. And the different properties of the amino acids help it to fold into the right shape. So some are flexible and some are rigid, some are hydrophobic, so they try to get away from the surrounding water and go into the middle of the protein, and so on. So if you're going to build a chain of 20 building blocks out of a chain of four building blocks, you're going to need at least three letters of DNA to describe each amino acid, because if you have two, you can only have 16 unique sequences, but if you have three, you can have 64 unique sequences, and this is actually how it works. So this is the table, the codon table, since each of these three letters is called a codon. Um, <coughs> I don't think I explained, the reason you're seeing A, C, G, and U instead of T is that RNA uses a slightly chemically different base called uracil. So A, C, G, U is the code when it's been copied to RNA. So each of these uh, three letter codons describes an amino acid. You'll also see that there is, um, M is also used as the start codon, so the protein starts here. This is where you should start building. And there's a few which mean the stop codon. And when the machinery gets to that point, it stops. Let's go. Um, and you'll also see that because 64 is more than 20, it's redundant. So there are mutations that could occur which don't change the protein at all, which we often call silent mutations. Okay. 
So finally, I'm just going to talk about one particular experimental technology. There are lots of experimental technologies, um, but this one is a source of a lot of the data that I deal with. So this is for reading. You've got a DNA molecule, and you want to get out a string that says, tells you what it says. Um, this is the current technology for doing that. Um, it's called next generation DNA sequencing, which is a name that doesn't have a lot of foresight in it. <laughs> I think they're now calling the next lot third generation sequencing, because <laughs> this was actually second. Um, so the problem is there's three billion letters in the human genome. Uh, we cannot, and even the longest uh, chromosome is about a quarter of a billion letters long. So a chromosome is a single molecule of DNA in your cell, one really long molecule of DNA. If you want to read the entire chromosome, which ideally is what we'd like, it's the longest of them is a quarter of a billion letters long in humans. And we can't read that long. Like We don't have a technology to do that. So what we actually do is cut it into lots of little pieces and read the little pieces. And because you're going to miss some, we cut it into lots of little pieces, then copy them using the DNA copying enzymes, and then read them, which means we'll read some of them many times, or some parts of the genome many times, and we'll miss some bits. So that's the nature of the, the data that we're given to deal with. Um, and when I say you cut it into short reads, at the moment, that's probably likely to be like 150 base pairs, 150 letters long. Um, when I started working in this field like three years ago, it was 36. So it's, it is, technology is actually changing quite a lot. Um, but it's still a lot less than 3 billion. So just to give you an idea what you would do with this data, the two most common very first things you do when you've got lots of short strings, 150 letters long, the obvious one is you might just try to look at how they overlap and reassemble the original sequence that you would have liked to read in the first place. That's actually much harder than it sounds because there are errors and there's missing coverage and there's repeated sequences. So it's actually quite computationally difficult. Um, if you are dealing with a species that is well studied, like humans, then you already have what we call a reference genome, which is that big string I showed you. And in that case, it's computationally much easier to just compare your reads to that reference because although there's differences between us, the vast majority of our DNA is identical because we're the same species. There's actually only quite small differences relative to the rest of the three billion. So that's uh, basically string alignment algorithms, right? Finding differences between two strings, but it's on a really massive scale, so you have to make optimizations. Um, when is the gong? 10 minutes before? Okay. All right, and this is just a quick visualization of some of the things I've been talking about. If you, uh, sequence, if you sequence DNA and you get back a bunch of reads, each of these gray rectangles is a read that has been aligned or mapped to the reference genome. The reference genome is represented by those blocks of colors at the bottom where there's four colors and they represent ACGT. So that's actually just the sequence zoomed out. So it's color rather than letters. And we've taken each of our reads and matched it to its best location on the genome and you can see that they all, well, half of them seem to have a difference from the reference, so probably this individual has a difference from the reference at that location in the genome. Okay. All right, so let's talk about Python a bit. Um, I'll try to get fairly rapidly onto the IPython notebook stuff. I almost called this talk IPython notebook for bioinformatics because I use it so much now, but I, not quite. Um, so a quick overview of just what kind of computational stuff do you do in bioinformatics. Um, and this is kind of in order. So you do the stuff at the top of this list first. So if the, there's one class of stuff is the computationally intensive stuff. You get in the raw data, which is really big, you know, millions of reads, and you align them to the genome, for instance. Um, that's rarely done in Python. It's usually probably C is the most common thing those algorithms are written in, and I rarely write them. Like, you're usually using someone else's tool. Um, data munging, which means uh, bioinformatic data is distributed, it's, it's offered by various organizations throughout the world in various databases and giant text files um, in many formats. 
I spend a disturbing amount of time converting data from one format to another. And so a lot of your time when you're doing data analysis, you're data munging, right? And that's the sort of thing something like Pandas is really good for. Um, there's a big class of stuff which you could just characterize as statistics. So for instance, I've got 10 cancer samples and 10 normal samples. Which genes are important in this cancer? Can I answer that question with statistics? And uh, visualization, which is also something Notebook's really nice for since the visualization is immediate. Uh, genomics is a very visual science because genomic data has coordinates and we also just deal with comparative numerical values a lot. Okay, so this is another just overview slide which I'll talk about for a little bit. Um, this is roughly in order of what, th and this is biased by my own work. Um, there will be people in genomics who have a different list but the particular kind of genomics I do, this is what I do. Um, you might notice that the actual bio ones that I've mentioned are actually at the bottom. That's not meant to be a, a knock on them because they're actually really useful when you use them. Um, it's just that so much of genomics is kind of data munging and dealing with text files that one of the reasons I like Python for it is that it's good at that and you can use generic tools to do that. So I Python notebooks at the top, I've kind of Maybe during the last year, I've converted to using it. It's, it always takes a certain amount of effort to convert what you're doing because you feel like you never have time to learn the new thing instead of just doing the analysis that's in front of you. But now I've, I'm converted and I'm an enthusiast and a proponent. Um, obviously, just SciPy and NumPy and Matplotlib for plotting pandas. Um, there's a lot of tabular data, lists of all the mutations we found, um, tables of how much these genes were expressed in cancer versus normal. Um, and for that kind of manipulation, pandas is excellent. And the stuff that gives me access to R. So you saw, I think in uh, Ed's slides, R is still above Python. In bio, that's, I think that's true as well. And it's mostly because statisticians use R. And so the cutting edge statistical algorithms are implemented in R. And I still go to R for that stuff because that's where they are. Um, but now I can do it through R magic, <laughs> so that's nice. Um, PyBed tools, I will, oh sorry, I'll, sh I'll show you REST APIs in my example actually and why I mention those. And I'll show you PyBed tools as well. Um, those libraries are all libraries for manipulating particular types of genomic data. All right, and I just want to put in a plug for the Rosalind project. Has anyone here heard of this? Okay, this thing that was a subset of the bio people. Um, so this is, if you've heard of Project Euler, it's conceptually somewhat similar in that it starts with a really easy problem, like count how many C's are in this string, and then it gets progressively more difficult until it's got to quite interesting things, and it has a dependency tree of which problems you should solve first. Um, so I've seen people use it for learning bioinformatics algorithms, and I've seen people use it, people in bio use it to learn to program or to learn Python. And I think it's a really good resource for both. And there is also now a Coursera course based on it, which is also very good if you're interested in that sort of thing. And I think there's another Coursera course based on it coming out. So if you Google Coursera, which is the online learning platform Coursera for bioinformatics, you'll find those courses. Okay, so IPython notebook. I think I have plenty of time. Um, so I will have a couple of slides, but then I'll do a demo. So this is, I apologize for the extremely verbose slide. Um, you don't have to read it, I'll talk about it. So I guess I just wanna say, because I converted to using notebook for a lot of my analysis, I used to use R for a lot of the same data munging tasks that I once would have used. This, sorry, the data managing tasks that um, I would now use this for. Um, and I actually managed to start using Notebook, firstly, just as a, literally as a notebook, because I was trying to, you know, wet lab biologists are really good about keeping notebooks because they have to, like they have to get them signed. It's a physical book. Um, but computational biologists, no one's gonna breathe down your neck if you don't keep track of what you're doing, but you really should keep a running log of what you're doing. Uh, so I kept trying to do that and I kept 
not keeping it up. And one reason I didn't keep it up was that none of them are flexible enough and can't, for instance, write equations easily in a Google Doc or something. So actually, I, I managed to first start using it literally just as a notebook, like just because it's marked down and it produces, <laughs> produces a JSON file, which is portable and versionable and all sorts of nice things. Um, but I now use it for most of my analysis, um, mostly because of pandas. <laughs> I think that's a major factor. Um, and also because, of course, because you can do uh, inline plots, so you can visualize stuff. Uh, and the advantage over R, R has a very nice syntax for certain kinds of data exploration, but when I get up to a hard bit and I have to actually write some real code, I don't like writing code in R, so now I can write it in Python. So the hard bits have become easier. I think that's the big difference. So if I need to parse some XML or something, that's a lot nicer. Um, and I also find that I can write just a great big on-the-fly analysis where I just try different things, and then I can go through and kind of organize it with headings. I'll show you this. And it becomes like a navigable document, which is quite nice, like a good starting point for discussion with collaborators or for starting to write up the methods section of the paper. And we've also started using it a bit for Certainly for collaboration with biologists, it's great because it's great you can sit down next to them and say, here's the graph, and they say, oh, what if we change the threshold, and you can change the threshold and see how the plot changes, and this is really nice. Um, and also, some of the people in my workplace, I actually work with them where we have a shared server and we look at each other's code, and I'll talk about that actually a bit later. Um, I also just want to mention this because if you are, this room probably has a lot of Australian researchers in it, and that means this resource is actually available to you. You just might not know about it. Um, and this is what I use as a um, IPython notebook server that I can work with collaborators on. Because Australia now has a research cloud, which is somewhat analogous to Amazon Web Services EC2. So you can uh, launch an instance, and we've got some scripts which configure a bunch of bioinformatics tools. and. Notebook is one of those things. Um, if you're at a Australian research institution that uses the Australian Access Federation, which includes all the universities, I think, then you already have an account and you have a very small default quota. So you can try it out. So you can follow this link and try it. Um, and you can also follow these links if you want to <coughs> use it for uh, bioinformatics or for notebook. This is what I use for my setup. So my disclaimer is I'm not involved in the cloud itself, but I am involved in the GBL project, the Genomics Virtual Lab project. So I'm mostly putting this up for reference so that people who have access to this resource can go and find it. Um, I think I might be just about up to where I want to do a demo. Yes, I do. I'll come back to this. Yes? Now, okay, so the first thing I'll show you is this table of contents, because I'm going to use it. Is this big enough? Do I need to increase the font size? Okay. If people at the back wave at me, I will. Um, so I'm actually, I've got a little thing here introducing Notebook, but I'm kind of assuming this audience knows about Notebook already, this being the science and data Python intersection, so I won't come back to this unless people ask me questions about it. Um, but you can see, this is the table of contents extension, this button. So it's an it's a IPython notebook extension. It's actually one of MinRK's. It's the first thing I install when I use notebook because I now find it indispensable. Um, and it basically takes your hierarchical headings, if you haven't seen it before, and turns them into this table of contents. So I can jump down to where I want to go. So this is what I use when I've just done a giant rambling on the fly, try different things analysis. If I stick headings into that, then I can jump to the bits that are actually important and rerun them. Um, so I'm actually going to start with this end bit because I think it will be more intelligible that way. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about a project I've started working on. It's still in very early days. Um, it's, so there, are, or there exists this browser a genome browser called Dalliance, uh, which is not mine. It's by Thomas Down. 
Um, and it tries, it's JavaScript based, it's designed to be embeddable. It's based on open standards like DAS, so it goes and retrieves uh, annotation tracks like where the genes are from servers around the world. You can tell it, go and get the ensemble track for these genes and it will display it for you. So it looks like this, it's interactive and scrollable and I, could, I should be able to zoom in to the point where I can start seeing things, for instance. So these, for instance, are um, the genes. So this is showing the x-axis is basically the position in the genome along a stretch of DNA. And these things here are, there is a gene at this position in the, the genome. And here's what we know about that gene. So if you were to try to, if you want to put this browser into a web page of yours, you basically embed some JavaScript where you specify what sources you want of information. So it seemed to me that this would solve a problem that I have, which is if I'm working with some data on a cloud server, sometimes these files are really big, like 400 gigabytes, and I don't want to download them. But I do want to visualize them. So, and I'm doing a lot of work in iPython Notebook, so it seemed to me that an embeddable JavaScript browser could be a good solution to that. If I can embed it in a notebook, then I can visualize my files without downloading them. So I've made a start on doing that. So all the features of Dalliance are not mine at all. They are Thomas's. Um, I'm just trying to writing a wrapper for it. At the moment, that wrapper is at the very early stage where it basically works, um, where you can specify your sources as Python dictionaries rather than specifying them in JavaScript and then pass them in. And it will go away and load them and display. So this is, it's not an extension, it's a Python module, which I haven't pushed out to anywhere yet. <laughs> um, but you can see, for instance, it becomes nice because you've got your list of sources and if I remove one, it should just disappear, right? I should be able to specify them and add to them. Um, the obvious next step for this is uh, the JavaScript code actually creates a browser object, which you can then call methods on. So you can say set location, for instance, to browse to a different location programmatically. The sensible thing to do would be to track that JavaScript object with a Python object so that I can give access to those same methods calls. So I just wanted to, to demo that briefly. I'm actually going to jump back now and give you an example of a real analysis. And this is a slightly simplified version of an actual analysis I had to do for a real project recently. Um, So here's the problem. So I'm going to demonstrate, I, I was going to show you pandas, but I thought better of it. And I think that's good because you're going to see lots of pandas today, I think. Um, and also the stuff I do in pandas is not particularly revolutionary. It doesn't use any of its really advanced features. Um, so instead I'm going to show you an example of using a REST API to retrieve data and manipulate data. So you don't, there's going to be a lot of words because this is a notebook and it's designed for people to be able to come back later. Uh, you don't need to read everything. I will tell you what's going on. But <laughs> the basic, the motivation here is um, I've done some next generation sequencing on a DNA sample from, from cancer. And I want to know what mutations there are in this cancer. And specifically, I want to know if there are mutations in, just for the sake of argument, this list of genes here. And these are actually genes involved in the process of DNA mismatch repair, which means if the DNA somehow gets copied wrongly, they can repair the error. So if these genes get mutated, then it leads to more mutations because you no longer have error repair or you've got substandard error repair. So I want to look at, at my um, DNA, my sequenced information from the DNA and find out if there are any mutations in these particular genes. Um, I've got variant detection software, so I can take my aligned reads. I think if we just go back here for a second. So remember this visualization. This is what I mean when I say aligned reads. It's stored as what we call a BAM file. So I can look for, for variants exactly as it's doing there. So I can run a piece of software which will take um, 
those reads that have been mapped to a reference genome and look for differences. And that will find me mutations. But I specifically want to know about mutations in these particular genes. So I could run the software over the whole genome and then try to pick out those genes, or I could pick out those regions of the genome and then just run the software over them, which is better for my purposes because it will be much, much faster. Uh, but either way, no matter what I do, I need to know where the genes are. So the example I'm going to show is just how do you get the coordinates of those genes in the genome? So what I need is a file like this, actually without the header row, but just for illustration purposes. A file like this, which is called a bed file, which actually means browser extensible data. But it just shows um, for each gene which, which chromosome is it on, what coordinate what position on that chromosome does it, the gene start at, and what position does it end at. And if I know that for all my genes, then I can pass that information into my tools, and they will just examine those regions, and they'll run a thousand times faster, and give me back the information I actually want. So the actual computational task is I've got just a list of gene names, and I want a bed file giving their coordinates. And what I would have done um, once upon a time, it's not that hard a task. It's a little bit more complicated, as you'll see at the end. But once upon a time, I would have downloaded the giant tabular text file with all the genes in it and written a Perl script to parse out the bits I needed. Um, here's a slightly nicer way to do it. So here's my list of genes. Um, and Ensemble has this information on genomic coordinates. And Ensemble now has a REST API. Pro probably everyone knows what that is. If you don't, it's basically, um, well, for our purposes, it's an HTTP REST API, so I can construct a URL to query for information. And the um, basic feature of a REST API is that it should be stateless. So if I make multiple queries, it shouldn't matter. And if we follow, if we look at Ensemble's REST API uh, root URL, it has documentation, and we can see that This is the query I'm interested in. I can look up a gene by species and gene name. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll use requests. Uh, if I were doing this in the real world, I would either reuse someone's library or I would write a reasonably robust function to do this, to you know handle errors and stuff. But for the sake of a demonstration, we don't care about any of that stuff. Um, this REST API will give me back XML or JSON. Generally, that's what they do. I want JSON. I'm going to specify in the HTTP header that I want JSON. And then if we just pick one of our genes, say the first one, which was ATR, and we'll just manually try the URL to check that it works. So this is what that query will look up. Well, this query will look like it's slash lookup slash symbol slash human slash ATR. If I run that, it comes back with this JSON which has various bits of information about the gene that I just queried. Um, you can see that it's a gene that codes for a protein, it's in their core database, et cetera. The information I'm interested in is this seq region name, which is which chromosome the gene is on, the uh, start coordinate, and the end coordinate. So that's, that's the information I needed. So I'll just turn it into a little function, which just returns those three fields, and try it out. So my function takes human, gene name, and returns the coordinates. And now I'll write another very tiny function which prints out that information in the format that I needed. So gets the coordinates and prints out tab separated values together with the name. So this is, this is actually the exact format that I need. So that was really simple and more pleasant than dealing with giant files and going out and writing a separate Perl script, to my mind. Um, so I could just now write a list comprehension to generate the whole, this will take a second because it has to query the API for each gene individually. Um, and this is actually the file I want, right? Except you can see it's out of order. So the chromosomes aren't in order and also the positions aren't in order. And that will actually make some of the tools I want to run panic if I give them this file as input. They expect it to be sorted. Uh, you can also see that these two appear to be, they're probably variants of the same gene, so their coordinates overlap. So I'm going to query the same region twice, or again, I'm just going to crash whichever tool I try to run, because it expects unique regions. 
Um, so I'm going to use PyBedTools, which is one of the libraries I mentioned. It's a wrapper around bed tools, and it manipulates this kind of data, right? So it manipulates genomic interval data, and it does so in an optimized way. So manipulating genomic intervals, say if you have two files of intervals and you want to merge them, find their overlaps, that's not too difficult unless you want to do it efficiently, and then you actually need to do it right. Otherwise, it could actually be really slow. So BedTools does it right. And this is just a small wrapper around it. So I just need to do a couple of steps to turn this file into something I can actually use. Uh, firstly, I can pretend that the text I just produced with my list comprehension is a, f a bed file, and I can just read it in with this from string equals true. So I'll make a bed tool object, which you can see looks exactly the same, but now it's a bed tool object. And so now I can apply bed tools um, nice utility functions to it. So first I'll sort it. And then I will run merge, which looks for overlapping intervals and merges them. And you can see that once I've done that, there's one less row, and these things which were overlapping are now um, just one larger interval. And you can see that the chromosomes are in order, and within each chromosome, the regions are in order as well. So if I write that out to a file now, I can use it to look for mutations in those genes. That's pretty much what I needed. Um, so I think that's, that's all the demo I wanted to show you. I will stop in a second, but I just want to go back to the slides and um, put up one more, because I think this is a good group to have this discussion with. Except for some reason, I'm stuck. OK. OK, so this was the last slide. Um, so now I started using Notebook a lot for analysis. I use it to sit down with biologists and say, look at these pretty graphs, and what should we do next? Um, but I also work with you know, some, of my, some of my colleagues who work in a similar way to me, where we try to actually work on the same analyses at the same time. And for that, um, Notebook is it's way better than having your own little bundle of private scripts. But I still feel like it, there's more that could be done. It's not really designed for multiple users to use at the same time, right? You have your own document, and you work on that document. And if someone else edits it, it's hard to tell what they did or why they did it. Um, on the IPython Notebook roadmap, I think there's a multi-user server coming. As far as I know, it won't really be about collaboration. It will be about multiple logins so that you don't have to run lots of different servers. Um, the Sage Math Cloud example, if people have seen that. I don't know if people have seen that, but it, it does try to solve this problem. I don't know whether it's the right solution. In fact, what I want to say here is um, not so much how do we implement stuff, but what should the solution look like? Because right now, I don't feel like I know what the solution should look like, and that's really the first step. Uh, the way Sage Math Cloud does it is two people can edit a document. You can see one another. By a document, I mean a notebook. You can see one another doing the edits, and you're actually sending commands to the same kernel, which is both cool and terrifying. It means that if I execute a cell, and then you execute a cell that changes the value of my variable, and then I execute another cell, it changes, right? So you'd better be talking to each other. So maybe that's a good solution. I don't know. Um, people, when I say this, they say, have you tried using Git? Because it's, it's just a JSON file. And yeah, I have, but not when I'm collaborating because it, Git is great for versioning and keeping a log, but when you're working with someone else, it doesn't solve that problem, I think. Not in this case, because this is not software. It's more like a document. An analysis is a document with code in it, not software with writing in it. So I guess I just want to put the question out there of, as scientists, um, how would we like to collaborate when we're actually writing code? What's a good model for that? OK, and I'm going to, to stop. <laughs> um, see if we have any time for questions. Thank you very much, Claire. So yes, we do have. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do have about five minutes for questions. Okay. Uh, hi, Claire. Paul party from uh, ANU. Um, um, asking a tangential question here, but um, when you actually go to publish your work, um, how, um, if at all, does IPython Notebook help there? And there's a second part to that question, which is even more diabolical, and that is when you're actually reviewing other people's, you know, um, submitted work, um, would that 
is there any infrastructure that could help there? Because generally what you get is something thrown over the fence. Yeah. Um, I'd say when you go to write a paper up, you pretty much have to rewrite it. Like the notes to myself or the notes to my collaborators, are just they're not even using the same language that a paper expects you to use. But it's extremely helpful to have um, that document, like your notes that you wrote as you went, let's try this, let's try this, um, when you're doing that writing. Um, so it's really just that you have a good initial, um, a good initial draft in some sense of the methods. Um, there's, when, peop when people are reviewing papers, it would be nice if people made their analyses available somewhere where the reviewer could get at it in this kind of sense. It's incredibly rare. Um, I don't know, there's something called Authoria, which is an attempt to let people link notebooks into their actual papers. I think all this stuff is actually just getting started. It's definitely not like widespread standard practice, not even in bioinformatics, which is a fairly you know, technically literate science. Hi, I'm Frank Sainsbury from Tasmania. The, I went last week to a talk on the research infrastructure that Nectar people are putting out. And one of the bits of that is a huge piece of data storage and to discuss this same issue, that there's no compa compulsion on people to put their data where I can find it. I'm actually hunting someone in South Australia who's now a head of department and 10 years ago did a study and we want to do a comparative study and to get the data out of it is a nightmare. Yeah. Because she's now so busy, she might be in Europe or whatever. Mm. And this, is, so the, the research infrastructure thing, the RDSI, I think it is, yeah. is coming into place. These guys were head honchos from wherever. We're talking about, it. but the the oceanographic people have got to march on everybody because they've been doing this for a while. But the tools exist, and um, and they're still thinking about the same things you're thinking about. How do we put it up? Once we put it up, how do we put notebooks over it so we can find it again and do it? So. Yep. As I say, more of a statement than a question, but people should be aware that, that there's, what, $70 million gone down the tube already, and there's a lot more money floating about. The government wants us to stick the stuff in one place and find it again, which I think is key to uh, leveraging all the work that people have done. Thank you. Yep. Do you have uh, any thanks. comments on that, Claire? Um, yeah, so I'm aware of RDSA. So Nectar is the organisation that uh, has built the research cloud, which is what I showed for VMs. Um, and they, there's also... Half that money went to them and half that money went to RDSI. So half the money went to compute and half went to storage. Um, which means that we've now got the compute but we don't have the storage because they were built separately. So yeah, we're looking forward to this coming online and getting access to it. Um, the other thing I'd just comment on with data being accessible is that situation's definitely improved and it mostly depends on the journals. A lot of journals you submit a paper to now, it's a requirement of your submission that you upload the data to. Uh, it can be an international archive, it usually is and that you set a policy for who's allowed to access that data. So a lot of the time, you're not allowed to submit your paper to the journal until you can give them a DOI for your uploaded data. Sorry, right, that, that's all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's, it's, it's got better, but that doesn't help very much if you want old data where you'll email the researcher and maybe they don't even have, maybe they've got it on an old hard drive somewhere and they don't even remember where to find it. Right? That's okay, we have um, time for um, two more quick questions, if you can be quick. Okay. Um, so uh, some, uh, sorry, I understand a lot of what you do is um, involves like graph theory and network theory. Some bioinformaticians I've spoken to have kind of scoffed at the idea of using Python or any other high level language arguing that it just can't um, perform adequately for things like network traversals and things like that. Um, and they've justified continuing to just build their tools in C++. Hmm. In your experience, is that, does that um, hold true? Is that a practical limitation or? I actually don't know. Uh, so when I put up that slide of what kinds of things do we do that involve computation, that very first thing, which was the computationally intensive tasks, that probably includes that stuff. and. Um, I could be writing those tools and maybe one day I will be, but right now in my current job I'm not. So 
I'm doing a lot of data analysis. I'm not doing a lot of writing of large tools. So mostly if I need to do a genome assembly, for instance, which is very much a graph-based graph algorithm, um, I will just be running a genome assembler tool, which was probably written in C. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure whether the, the language is really a constraint on those algorithms. Uh, Adrian Higgins from Planet Innovation. Um, I recently had uh, a need for collaboration using IPython Notebook and there really are no tools to support it. The merging of the, of the JSON files is just a nightmare. Um, I found one guy, Kaya Patel, uh, from Washington. Um, he's put together a, a, uh, uh, an implementation in the browser, uh, which then, then allows you to use uh, Google Docs to to manage oh, yes. collaboration. Actually, I saw that. I haven't it was absolutely brilliant. Had a chance to try it. Yes, yeah, so I've tried yeah. that. I've set that up on the computer. It works okay, really, really well. Um, anyone can grab it at, at Jupiter slash Collaboratory on GitHub. Um, yep. Yeah, it's okay. brilliant. I'll have to ask you about it. <laughs> yeah, what we're doing at the moment is maintaining separate notebook documents with a shared server, so at least we can see each other analyses, others' analyses, and we can kind of cut and paste. And while it seems clunky, it's still light years ahead of you've got your own bundle of scripts in your directory somewhere. Thank you very much again, Claire.